chemistry, there were some courses about philosophy, um, there was some course, there was one course about memes. What programming language do you recommend they take up? Recently, um, with, with a collaboration of NASA, mm -hmm. send, a, send a capsule to get a, like samples from the asteroid and it was one of the biggest things we did. Get deported? No, no, you might actually get deported, yeah. yeah. So you All right, uh, everyone, welcome to the first podcast ever at Adastra. And I'm your host, Muhammad Ali. And on the first episode of the podcast today, I have a special guest. I, I thought of many different people I could br bring on the show, but I ultimately decided to go with my own brother who happens to be visiting us uh, from the U.S. and I got him on the show so we can share some of his experience of studying abroad uh, or how he uh, ended up going abroad and also some you know quick tips about how to become a successful student overseas. Yeah, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's really nice to have you on the show. Uh, quite frankly, I think this show is going to be our biggest conversation, the longest conversation ever, because we don't do much talking, right, at home. We don't do much talking over the phone. So it kind of gives me a chance to get, get to know you better as a person and gives you a chance to get to know me. So, And I feel like that's the whole reason why I decided to have this show in the first place is because not necessarily to make content for people out there centered around education, but rather make all these uh, videos as a note to my future self and at the same time get to learn from all these different amazing people uh, I'll be having on the show. Yeah, thanks for uh, coming today. All right, so let's get started. Why don't you tell our audience a little bit about yourself? Yeah. yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Akbar Ali. Uh, I'm currently studying at the University of Arizona in the US mm -hmm. and I'm uh, sponsored by Eliud Emili Foundation. My majors in the University of Arizona is computer science and I'm minoring in business administration. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm pretty like excited about IT programming, computer science, and uh, just the idea of technology uh, being pretty significant in the future. And I do appreciate you having me on this podcast. Um, it was, it's a really great way for me to share my personal views and my experiences that I had in the U.S., the application process, um, how I took my ILTS and SAT, which is going to be, which I hope is going to be pretty interesting to people who are watching. Um, so and it's also a great way for us to have a conversation. As you mentioned, we rarely talk besides small conversations we have at home. So uh, I'm just like pretty excited and I, I hope that anyone who's watching this will be able to gain some value by watching this podcast and uh, yeah, let's dive into this podcast. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. So I want to take a step back a little and talk about your you know background. Can you tell a little our audience about how you got into IELTS. So was it some kind of a push from family or, or was it some kind of peer pressure? Or so why did you get into English? Yeah. Why, so when did you start learning English? So walk us through that process. Yeah, so um, I started learning English, I think it was in my seventh grade. Mm -hmm. I used to do it only for the summer when we had like summer break for three months. I wanted to do something meaningful. At the time, I think me starting learning English and just starting this whole IELTS journey was a, sort of a push from the family because at the time, your parents decided what kind of a career or what kind of a thing you're gonna be involved in doing for the rest, like for the majority of your life. Because it was kind of a thing where we were still like uh, school students. We didn't know what was like right for us. I was actually pretty interested in STEM field subjects like math, I was pretty good at it, physics, um, IT and other things. 
but I never thought that learning another language, English, was going to be a big part of my life. So I started and when I was in seventh grade and I actually didn't, I wasn't really good at it. I struggled very much. I didn't know any words. Uh, we didn't even have English classes in our school up until like fifth or sixth grade, if I remember it correctly. So we only learned like Russian from first class to all the way to 11th class. Uh, great. So I think um, in a way learning English was for me pretty hard and enjoyable experience at the same time. Uh, when I, for the first couple of years, when I did it only on summers, like seventh, eighth grade, I did learn uh, only stories, and those those were like mainly involving just increasing the vocabulary and getting comfortable with the whole idea of learning another language. So we did a uh, starter, then beginner, um, elementary, intermediate. I think many people are like familiar with those textbooks which contain stories. And I did learn those things, increased my vocabulary. Then after a couple of years, when I got like pretty comfortable with English language, then I started learning grammar. Um, first, I went to Mr. Isomadin for uh, those stories that I mentioned earlier. But for the grammar part, I, meant, uh, I went to Genius Education Center, which is owned by Mr. Kadirf. And we learned, I learned grammar for a year and it was actually pretty good experience for me as well and because I get to learn fundamentals and just the basics of how to make a sentence, being able to speak at length and just um, got introduced into many things. Then other, after that I started, um, once I completed my one year grammar, I went to Mr. Jaraif where I was immediately at the practice level where I did I took mock exams so you went straight from grammar level to practicing IELTS questions yes in a, not in a way that I did like actual mock exams but mm -hmm. I was kind of close to taking practice exams I was just a month away from taking practice exams my understanding my level of like just doing the basic vocabulary thing from an upper intermediate and other like stories book and just learn because in the grammar itself you not only learn the grammar, you also learn lots of like other things that involve your reading and listening skills because in a way that you should be able to integrate all those things at the same time. You should be able to like see if the grammar is correct uh, in the reading and also in the listening parts. But um, yeah, I, I only did a month of like some books, I think it was ELS and some other reading books before I actually started doing Cambridge level practice exams. Yeah, at first I, I, I only used to get like 20, 22 questions right out of 40. But me doing consistently practice actually helped me improve where my peer groups took the exam on August. Then I ended up taking another year because I wasn't old enough to take the ILTS exam. So, yeah. So your whole English learning experience stretches stretches a few years, right? Yeah, that, it, it, it stretched like a couple of years. I think it's as, as much as four years, but it, it wasn't as rigorous four years. Like I'm constantly learning. As I said, the first two years were just um, summer long thing, three, four month thing. But uh, like the, the, the thing that I mentioned also when I prepared from, it was I think year 2019, I prepared from April to August. August is when my group took the ILTS exam. They they went to Tashkent and took the exam. And I stopped doing any practice exams. I, I stopped like doing ILTS stuff for five, four or five months until um, December, January when I had to take the ILTS exam on February. Then I just went to Tashkent. I think I went there a month in advance where I was greeted by you. You were at the time studying at the Westminster University and you were also working in Thompson. I, the, the whole point of me going there a month in advance is because I, I, I kind of didn't like the, um, I was not as social at the time. I didn't like studying with a group. 
I kind of thought that I'm gonna study, I'm gonna self-study everything. And therefore I went to Tashken a month in advance to do some practice with you because my speaking at the time, as you as you might be aware, me not having spent this much time in a classroom environment and not being social might have deteriorated. So I actually wanted to improve it and see if I made any adjustments, see if I can make any adjustment to it. So, and you actually know what happened, Russ. We it, didn't has, have as much time. You were pretty busy at the time, but we were able to make best use case of our time. We, we did a couple of speaking interviews, but at the time I was um, pretty anxious, as you might recall. And uh, oh yeah, yeah, like you kept beating yourself up over this test and you were making such a big deal out of it, like a crybaby, right? Yeah. I, I, kinda, I, I sort of remember those days, like you came, came up to me and we used to practice a lot at night after I returned from work and would uh, would go over some IELTS topics and then would have all these deep conversations about life and philosophy and all that. Yeah, those were fun times. Yeah, I like that part of you where if I just ask a regular question, you got <laughs> all too serious and start talking about deep life questions. But I think it was in in general a pretty exciting experience. Yeah, I was pretty nervous. I think I, I'm I'm naturally that kind of nervous when it comes to because I spent all this like up to like four years of my life learning English, and me taking IELTS was a way to show yes, those four years were not a waste of time. I actually did something during those four years, and yeah, I mean we did practice, and I took the tests, and I was kind of mad at you that you registered me with. <laughs> Without IDP, your permission. Yeah, without my permission. All of my friends were taking the test um, on February 8th. They were doing this British Council because at the time they had a myth, mis, uh, myth misconception that British Council were giving, like, was giving high score on speaking and writing. I'm not sure if it's like well-supported argument, but yeah, you just registered me with that and you didn't even give a good enough explanation to do so. Then I took it, it turned out pretty well. I got a overall band score of eight. Which is, uh, for the record, is pretty impressive given the fact that at the time you were young, 15, right? Yeah, I was 15 years old. And, and, and getting eight at the age of 15 is still pretty impressive because uh, it took me actually three attempts to get to that level. My first attempt, I got 6.5. And then a few months later, I got 7.5 with a little bit of extra prep. And then I had to upgrade my score a few years later when I was looking for a job in Tashkent. Yeah. And you went on to do it. You pulled it off in your first attempt. And I was, I couldn't believe it. Yeah, I actually couldn't believe it either. Yeah. I thought you were you were the f one who registered to the ILTS and you mm. registered with your phone number. So you were the one who received my results after two weeks. And I was like, I was in a school at the, at the, at the time and I was pretty nervous. All my results are coming, c coming out. And I texted you and you sent it to me. And I couldn't believe, like, it's actually not something that I thought I was going to pull off. I thought you added that, that text message. I was like, are you, are you for real? Is that like, I'm going to have a heart attack right now. Are you joking? <laughs> then I went online and checked the IDP website and it was actually the case. And I couldn't believe myself because just like the uh, test procedure itself, you took me to both my speaking and the main exam. And if you remember, when I got out of my speaking exam, I told you, I really, I didn't perform as good as I thought I was going to, I needed to. Therefore, I have to do well on the remaining parts, remaining sectors. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think it's just for all those students who are learning IELTS, it's pretty important that you don't get as nervous, don't, don't stress about stress out about this exam that much it's gonna turn out fine if you just do your best and just hope that your years of experience will pay off because this is a text message that you sent it to me when i said i couldn't believe it 
and he said that hard work always pay, pays off and it 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 kind of like got into my brain it stuck with you it, right it got it stuck with me yeah so yeah it's just if you yeah. want we can also talk about the exam procedure and what i think yeah yeah for sure yeah. I'm, I'm sure our audience would be interested would be our they're curious to know how yeah. the entire thing went down. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah, because I wanted to delve deeper into IELTS segment a little bit more than other parts because I think the audience, the target audience for this is primarily just preparing for their IELTS. They are taking their SATs, preparing for US colleges. So for my IELTS part, um, I think, let's just start with speaking because speaking was the first part, for the first part of the exam that I took. I prepared with there's, I think there's still this book called Makkar. It's, it's written by this uh, Indian lady. And I think that people think that those topics will appear on the exam. Uh, we had this like strategy where we pre prepared everything and we tried to memorize. And I came to know that th that wasn't the best uh, strategy to prepare for IELTS. You sh because they immediately will know if you're if you're just like reciting what you memorize. So uh, you should just be able to comfortably speak in all topics. Right. Uh, can I uh, stop you here for a second and and share with you my take on whole memorization deal? This is actually the very approach we use here at Adastra, and I think it's by far the best technique to build knowledge base. And I feel like the main reason why your response, your answer in the interview sounds memorized is because uh, pr you're probably not uh, pronouncing the words right or you don't have the right reaction when you say certain words like adjectives, right? And, and you kind of come across stodgy and wooden while you're talking, uh, which makes me think that uh, you are basically reciting a, a lot, reciting a bunch of lines you learned before yeah i think so like all prepared mm -hmm. answers but 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 i think when it comes to like building uh, knowledge base of grammar and vocabulary uh, memorizing text from an authentic source like a credible source written by natives is arguably the best way to go about you know learning another language not just english yeah so. i do agree i do completely agree with your point when you said that uh, like learning those like answers and memorizing them as good when you're first like building the knowledge base. Yeah, yeah. Because actually, my first experience was it was was all those like stories. Mm -hmm. We we used to not only we learned all those stories and just like learned the vocabulary. We also had to recite the whole story to the teacher, mm -hmm. which helped us with our like um, speaking abilities. Yeah, that's we we had to literally learn the words learned the text word by word but we didn't have to like say all the words but it just gave us a sense of because we don't have anything well, like when you're first starting out speaking in English we don't have anything in the brain because we gotta like feed the data in the brain by just all those yeah. memorized texts yeah so the way I see it is like a phase in your learning process you have to go through and I and I see a lot of students just skipping it and going straight to practicing aspect and wondering why their vocabulary is kind of off when they're wondering why their grammar never gets better because they're simply not there because they simply skipped a very important stage in uh, in picking up another language yes so it, it's like large ai models mm -hmm. where in order for it to function you have to first feed in the data then yeah. it can function it can do multiple things on that thing when you don't have anything yeah you really don't don't have as much flexibility with that. That, that, that. That's for sure. Yeah. So I know memorization gets a bad rap in the in English space in IELTS space, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, this is a tried a practical approach to helping young learners, students, to develop a solid knowledge base, off of which you, they can build more of their English. So, and like you said, it kind of helps you develop that intuition for language, right? Yeah. So, yeah, and, and uh, your analogy of AI model is a perfect example. So, to build an AI, I'm, I'm no 
engineer, I'm no scientist, but I'm just, I'd assume that you'd have to feed it a lot of data so it can learn, make sense of its surroundings, the world and the people and the uh, different dynamics, like, and only then can it start uh, producing its own content. Only then can it start producing its own answers. So, and, and I see it the same way. Like, I feel like there is an arc to language learning where the first uh, two, three years of your uh, experience journey, you're going to have to uh, basically learn other people's lines and parrot them until they get, uh, they become stuck in your mind. And only then you can start sort of combining and, you know, blending, mixing them and come up with your own lines, your own structures, your own answers, your own ideas. Yeah, so, at that point, it will be like muscle memory. It will be, yeah. you'll be speaking subconsciously. So I think in that regard, you should, yeah, first be equ acquainted with as many topics as you can and memorize some like excerpts from those books. Um, and you should also, I think, practice. Uh, so those are for like just making the content out for your speaking. But also you should focus on your fluency and pronunciation. And I think you do that by just practice alone just if you if you're even reading something try to read it out loud because you got to like train those muscles and you just got to like um make it so that you pronounce each word individually and correctly and there was this earlier point that I was making to other students is that uh, they I think many students here they try to rush their answers and it it's uh, one of the big mistakes they make I think because when you rush your answers, you're in a fight or flight mode and your brain doesn't function as well. And you try to like use, uh, not be as fluent, you use uh, ums and other word fillers. And therefore, I think if you kind of like be in a relaxed environment, slow down and pronounce each word individually, I think that's going to work out pretty well for your speaking test. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. Now, what do you say we talk a little about your SAT experience as well? So once you had your IELTS figured, uh, yeah. I, I remember you taking up SAT. Yeah. So uh, walk us through yeah. the process of you getting into SAT and how it worked out for you. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to talk about my SAT experience, mm -hmm. but I'm going to give a little bit of like information about my reading and listening, just like one two minutes oh yeah yeah, yeah for sure like really yeah 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 of course with that. yeah because like i talked about my speaking and how i improved upon it for my reading and listening skills uh, i i just gonna want to give a segment of like what i got from the ilts my reading was nine mm -hmm. listening 8.5 speaking and writing was were sevens each so um for reading i think what this generation needs to know is that not only do you have to have a range of vocabulary, be able to skim, scam quickly, and be able to have the intuition to come up with the answers, but you also have to have immense concentration and focus levels. But I think with a current trajectory and like world trends where current students are folk, like are on their phones all the time, they're consuming this much data from, uh, they're watching reels from Instagram, YouTube, they're like, just like consuming short form content, their concentration, their attention level is kind of decreasing in a way. And I think that they should combat this by sometimes reading novels or magazine, something that involves uh, like longer attention like or watching a three hour long movie or something documentary or, or a podcast like this one right yeah. so basically doing something focus intensive yes right where you have to uh, sit down and focus yeah. concentrate for so a prolo because, prolonged amount yeah. of time i think it's pretty crucial that you have focus because i i never to be honest i never got nine in my exam, like mock exams that I used to do, never, mm -hmm. ever. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of a shock to me. But the thing I did that is, was, because the thing that happened was that w once I did the listening, I, I had to really use the restroom and th they don't really allow that during the breaks. You got to do it in the time of reading, right? So the reading time started, it was 60 minutes. Then I had to use the restroom, came back, it was like 52, 51 minutes. And I was like, 
yo, what the hell? This whole experience is ruined. Yeah. This was my only shot. What am I going to do? I had those thoughts immediately in my brain. Then what I did is I still have 50 minutes. I got to do really well. I just like put my hands and card my ears, just focus intensive. Nothing in the world exists except this reading test. And it worked out pretty well. I, I got through all the sections pretty fast. And by the time I was on passage three, I still had like 22, 25 minutes left. Then I did it on time. And and for my writing, it's also an interesting story where you, you kind of remember the part where you suggested me you should kind of do some practice, writing practice task once with map, but I had never done map. So and you surprisingly and on a test, I had map and I spent half an hour, which is not recommended for task one. Uh -huh. It was a map. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> I spent half an hour. Then I went on task two, was able to complete, complete it, but didn't have as many sentences for the conclusion part. So the, the point that I'm, I'm trying to make is that no matter how much you prepare for the exam, there will be slight, there are some, there will be some things that are unexpected that might mm -hmm. kind of throw you off, but mm -hmm. you should always be ready mm -hmm. and you should always rely on the knowledge, on the experience you had prior to the, uh, prior to the actual exam. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, you said that I should talk about SAT as well, right? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Like uh, uh, the whole uh, yeah. IELTS experience can be pretty frustrating for an average teenager, but I think uh, with enough preparation, right? and emotional control, which is, I think, also really essential because at the time, despite being very young, you uh, showed emotion, emotional maturity. You pulled yourself together in that moment, right? Because with a lot of teenagers, what happens is if anything like this happens, like things go wrong, uh, they're like, it's over. Yeah. yeah. But uh, you did not really give in to uh, sadness. You did not give in to depression. You weren't like, okay, it's all over. It's not really the end of the world. So you made do with what you had, right? Yeah. And, and it turned out pretty well. So all those teenagers out there who you th who think it's over when things don't go your way, it, it's not over until you say it's over. It's not over until the very last minute. So you got to give your all yeah. to it, right? Yeah, so it's you get, like... For me personally, also when I'm doing reading and listening exams, like let's just say I get over like passage two mm -hmm. and I kind of get a, get the feeling that I'm almost over, but you shouldn't like, you shouldn't feel relaxed until everything mm -hmm. is done. Like, like Kobe Bryant thing, if you have watched that interview where an interviewer, like a person asks, a journalist asks, how do you feel about this particular match? And he says that I don't feel anything. I is the job done? No, it's not done. So I still got to stay focused yeah. and get get over the entire thing. Kind of have that mamba mentality, right? Yeah. yeah, rest in peace. He was a great basketball player and an inspirational figure for many people out there, right? All right, uh, back to your SAT experience. Now, why don't you take mm -hmm. some time uh, and walk us through how you went about the whole SAT deal? And because it's something that's catching on in our hometown now, more and more students are getting into SAT. Yeah. Uh, and and the, the fact that it's a relatively new thing around here, uh, unlike in Tashkent, where uh, they've been doing it for years, students in the city are very curious to know success stories of students like you who uh, who had this before. Yeah, so they, they're curious to know uh, what kind of steps they're supposed to follow, take, and and they're curious to know if there are reliable websites and learning tools available out there they can use at their own convenience without ever, you know, taking face-to-face -face classes. So yeah, yeah. Please there, do, do do share your experience. Yeah, the, my uh, SAT experience was pretty interesting. When I got my LTS result, LTS results, I uh, knew the next step was learning math because English and math really go hand to hand when it comes to any discipline. Um, so I, I went to Serious Learning Center, um, which is in Bukhara, and I went there and I didn't at the time know about SAT and I didn't know, like at the time it was not as trendy as it is now. So I just prepared for like state exams they have for Uzbek universities and I prepared for Vesmisi University. 
I only went there for two, three months. Then I actually had friends who are a year older than me who are actually like taking their tests. I, I looked at their experience and some of them had SATs and it made me curious what the SAT was. I did some research and it was just a standardized test that US colleges look uh, in your application to make sure that you have the necessary knowledge and understanding of math and English to be able to get into their universities. So once I learned that, I actually abandoned my studies in Sirius and took on this path of learning SAT because the reason I didn't just stick to the Sirius Learning Center, at the time they didn't have the SAT program. We were just preparing for state exams. And I knew that I looked at the practice question that SAT had and it was nothing that we were learning at the time. It was like SAT questions and state exam questions are entirely different in terms of math. So what I did was I just went online, did some research. Can I actually study this or, because like I didn't have the option of going to an in-person class. I had to learn by myself online. So what I did was I discovered the website called canacademy.org where they have very useful videos, exercises, quizzes, and other things where you can learn for free. And there, they have eight standardized mock exams given by College Board, which is a company that hosts SAT exams. So I just like over the summer on, on those three months prepared every day because there was quarantine, not much to do. I just played online chess. <laughs> and uh, and because do you still play chess online? I, I do play it sometimes, but yeah. as not as rigorous. I actually got on like, because like I do watch YouTube and there was this like recommendation of the mm -hmm. World Rapid and Chess Championship mm -hmm. that's happening, Blitz Championship. And it's happening in Samarkand in Uzbekistan. A world and championship taking yes. championship taking place in Uzbekistan. Yes. That's and a big deal. That's a that's a huge deal. It's like e I've been fascinated with chess from the age since the age five. Uh -huh. So because my grandfather taught me how to play chess and stuff like that. But like Magnus Carlsen, all elite like world class chess players, Hikar Nakamura, Leon Arena, they were all in Samarkand playing chess and um yeah so at the time i did play chess and prepared for sat and yeah it was it was a pretty hard journey because i was doing it on my own which is one of the advantages of self-studying mm -hmm. is that it's pretty hard journey if you are a lone wolf and if you can take on the responsibility of holding yourself accountable and not give up not be distracted with the internet and just be just have enough willpower to endure the whole journey mm -hmm. then you can do it otherwise it's not for you so for the record uh, what was your what, what sat score did you get so after i prepared it for three months i took it on uh i took it on september and i think i got yeah if i remember correctly 30 and 80 mm -hmm. so i got 750 from math and I got six minutes from reading and writing. And at the time, I was pretty, um, this, uh, kind of a, not like not the score that I was expecting, because I was expecting somewhere above like 40 and 50. And I think, um, yeah, that, that whole thing kind of uh, ruined my dreams of getting into very prestigious universities, not going to lie, because I had a really good score of eight. Mm -hmm. And if I were just to crack this one, get over like 450 or 50, I, I would I would have a really chance of getting top prestigious universities like Harvard, Yale, I would Princeton and stuff like that. So, but actually, it's not that bad of a score. It was in 93 percentile, which means that I, that I did better than 93 percent of test takers. Um, once I got that score. Um, I knew what the next step was. I got, yeah, if you like want me to like delve deeper into. Yeah, that was actually something else I was meaning to ask, right? So once you had your IELTS and SAT figured, so where did you go from there? Like, oh, what was your next destination? Because I know that a lot of students are out there would very much like to know how to proceed once they get there 
IELTS and SAT uh, figured uh, some students go looking for an agency uh, which can help them out you know, with their documentation and putting together their college application. So what was your experience? How did you go about <clears throat> going from having IELTS score and SAT to getting into a U.S. university? Yeah, I think it's... Um, so when it comes to agencies and stuff, I think since you got IELTS and SAT, you don't really need an agency. Mm -hmm. You have the basic English and just common sense skills to enough to figure out what the university wants, how to apply there, how to get scholarship, how to get the visa. So you don't need... I, I I don't I don't see that much benefit of at the time it was not on my like best interest to apply with a agency I just did it myself um, I knew I took SAT and I knew it was for the U.S. colleges so I did some research when it comes to how to apply to them so there's this app called Common App where um, it's just a it has a really good user interface when it comes to applying to U.S. colleges, you can just like list out all the U.S. colleges that you want to apply to, and you can do up to 20, and you can also do it directly through the university website, and you just like fill out basic information, upload your recommendation letters, um, they have some essays ch saying like why you're choosing this university particularly, why you're choosing this major particularly, and all those questions that are related to getting to know you. And I think at the time, I did apply to all 20 universities. And the university that I'm currently studying at, University of Arizona, was not in those 20. I applied directly through the website. And um, yeah, they, they actually reach out to you if, you have further if they have further questions. And um, for me, the, the hardest part was getting recommendation letters because I already had my ILTS and SAT um, where I could like just upload the certificate. Some require you like send an official official transcript where you have to contact the company. And if, if you send too many copies of it, they charge you. And getting recommendation letters was pretty hard for me because at the time, most of my teachers, um, like if I want to get I was good at like physics, math subjects, and my my teachers didn't speak English, so yeah. it's all was kind of an inter interesting story. I, I I couldn't like, I just got the sample recommendation letter and off the internet. Off the internet, like, not of course. I got their opinion. Is uh -huh. it something that you re re really want to send? Because those teachers they weren't really good with the computer, so I had to set up their accounts and just like send from their name because but i like read everything i translated everything is it something that you agree with i did, just didn't do it just for recommendation letters but yeah then they they, they reach out to you and say if they have further questions you're accepted or this this is a look document that we're lacking some universities want to make a so when I set up an appointment with an admission counselor, where I did I did one was a university called Sky Skymore, and we talked for an hour uh, with an admission counselor about like different things, what my interests were, and I actually got accepted to that university, but the tuition was pretty high for me. So this is all what the university applying to U.S. colleges is like. You, th there's actually many parts to it, but I condensed into one. Um, there's different terms when it comes to applying to U.S. colleges. There's early action, um, then there's rolling basis. I, 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 I think you can do some research. We can do some research about those. But I actually um, applied to many of my colleges, those in top 20, by early action. So that that has to be done by. November 1st, that's the deadline. And you have another deadline, which is called, I think, regular admission, which is gonna be, I think, March 1st, then you're gonna have late admission something. And the University of Arizona was in the rolling admission part, and I heard it back from them in like three weeks, I think, yeah. Yeah, uh, that's uh, pretty interesting, because I know a lot of students out there are so frustrated, because the application process can be 
complicated, right? And figuring it all out by by yourself and not having any outside help, like an agency or a mentor guiding you through the process, can be pretty daunting for many students out there. Yeah, and and I don't really, I don't think I could have done all this by myself. So in that sense, I feel like you're the boldest in the family that you went ahead. And you know, ventured into the unknown and figured all it out yourself. And they, it kind of goes to show that you have all these problem-solving skills, which I lack, yeah, and, and kind of makes me feel insecure about the whole deal. Yeah. Yeah. For the record, I feel like he's the smartest of the three, three brothers in the family. Yeah. Thank you for complimenting. But I think yeah. that in today's world, uh-huh. since you have this much access to the internet, uh-huh. I think. It's going to be because uh, like many at the time, not many people applied to U.S. colleges and got into them. But right now, since the advent of like um, everyone becoming aware of like SAT exams and getting into U.S. colleges and all those things, I think the number of students who are getting into U.S. colleges are going to increase. And I hope that continues for the next um, for upcoming years. And I, for for all, everyone who's watching, and I, I, I wanna like highly stress that applying to U.S. colleges can be stressful at times, but you shouldn't be um, demotivated. You should always persist, even though you get rejection letters. It's not the end of the world. You should always strive. You can. It doesn't mean like we have this like concept of like, oh, you're 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 running behind. You gotta like. As soon as you finish high school, you gotta get into, get into university. Even if, when you when you're in university, you gotta finish it in four years. Whereas in the U.S. and other countries, it's common to take gap gap year, where you do some research, uh, explore your interests, do some traveling. And I think it's pretty good if you're like in high school and you still haven't gotten into university, which you wanna study at. You, it's okay to take a one year break, retake the standardized exams, reapply to those colleges and see what happens. I think this is the best option so far. Yeah, like so not let the university's admission officers dictate your future, right? You gotta yeah, exactly. take control of your lives. Yeah. If they say no, then go to different university or try try your luck again. Yeah, it's like right? have the mindset, like, like US University rejects you. It's not that that they reject you. It's it's the way that um, how can I explain this? It's like you should be kind of you should have the confidence and understanding that it's it's not that your fault that they did, they did reject you. It's their fault that they didn't accept you. They didn't see the potential <laughs> in you. It's just yeah. you could you could be the next Elon Musk. You could be next Mark Zuckerberg. You have the potential that it's it, it's their fault that they weren't able to see it in you. Uh, if you have that m- mindset, you can build that confidence. But I think that it shouldn't be misguided in a way that you should also be self-aware of your situation and how to improve upon there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So a lot of useful advice. Now, what do you say we move on to your life in the U.S.? So, and I'd like to kind of break break this section of the podcast down into two, where you first talk about your academic life, and then we would love to hear about your uh, life outside school, like whether you work or hang out with your friends, or if you have any other interests and hobbies outside studying. So yeah, let's start off with your studies. Tell us a little about what your experience of studying in the U.S. like so? Yeah, yeah, studying in the U.S. is pretty spectacular. I, I would say that um, when I first got into the campus, it was like it was really large, mm-hmm. and I saw like lots of students. I was at first sort of bewildered by just like it's just I wasn't like the type of student who always. Um, I wasn't like as social at the time. I, I I I thought that I didn't perform well in front of people. But when I saw that many people and that much potential, that beautiful of a campus, I had this like urge to perform really well when it comes to my academics. And uh, yeah, the the classes over there are pretty interesting. Since my major is computer science, we do 
take lots of courses um, when it comes to programming. So I first started with Python. Well, my first two semesters were learning Python and the fundamentals, different data types and the uh, functions, object-oriented programming. And in the meantime, you also learn about general education courses. You have to take you have to select those primarily. Uh, I did select courses which were kind of at the time were about exploring perspective. They were about different uh, sciences. They were uh, there were some courses that relate to chemistry. There were some courses about philosophy. Um, there was some course. There was one course about memes. And uh, are you being yeah, there real was, right there now? Really Is that for real? Memes. Well, people have a misconception. <laughs> memes are just this internet thing. Memes, for example, like our national food plof, uh -huh. plof can also be a meme. It's a uh, human cultural transmission. It, it can be something that's passed on generation that can be language wise or something that symbolizes, that has a meaning to people of that culture. So yeah, I had no idea that abroad you get taught how to make memes at university. So those kids out there who love making memes, is that University of Arizona, yeah, right? Yeah, that's the University so of Arizona. You wanna, you wanna study academically, you wanna get a real education on how to make memes, go to University of Arizona. Yeah. That's super wild. So yeah, my, my, my university was mainly focused on, it's, it's real, it has really high ranking in astronomy mm -hmm. it's got its, its own observatory mm -hmm. and in this like, no way yeah your university had has got the, their own observatory uh, yeah. observatory where you can yeah. look at stars with yeah, those big lenses stars, yeah it's got like i think number one number one or two university uh, in the in the u.s when it comes to astronomy and we recently um with, with a collaboration of nasa mm -hmm. send a um, uh, Send a capsule to get a like samples from the asteroid, and it was one of the biggest things we did. It just gave, gave us a glimpse on. And were you part of that project? I wasn't like necessarily part of the project, but uh -huh. my my friends and roommates was. So uh, okay, all yeah, right. So, so you were not involved at all. No, I was not involved. But I'm just like giving out the accomplishments that my, my uh -huh. university had during those years. So, um, yeah, besides that, I, I, I was introduced with Python, then I did some programming. For, for those who understand programming, I did some object-oriented programming, which is Java. Then I did, I did learn some uh, web development um, tools, which is HTML and CSS, and a programming language, JavaScript. And I also worked on the backend, uh, and I did some programming with Node.js, and did some programming with um, MongoDB, which is a relationship type data, uh, database structure. And at the time, I uh, surprisingly I did well on general education courses than I did courses that are related to my major, which oh, is yeah. surprising. Yeah. But yeah, I did, I did take lots of art classes, <laughs> learned how to take pictures. And, and a quick question here, for those students who are wanting to pursue computer science in the future, what programming language do you recommend they take up? So it just depends on their interests and what they want to do with those programming languages. And I think that... Um, so if, if, if you were to rank them in terms of uh, utility, yeah, like sure. the one yeah, that brings sure. most utility and the one that's most applicable to t today's IT industry. Yeah, I think uh, it's interesting. Um, and I think that like learning different languages you not only learn one language and get really good at it, but you should also be familiar with the basic syntax of other languages. Mm -hmm. um, general rule of thumb, if you want to get into AI, data science, um, learning about neural links, large language models, mm -hmm. AI, you really need to get a grasp of Python. It's the most user-friendly language, and that language opens up uh, possibilities when it comes... Because it's got really good machine learning aspect to it. And it's the one that I started with. It's got really easy user-friendly syntax. And But if you want to do cybersecurity, you got to do with Java object-oriented programming, which is going to be pretty good for you. And it just has encapsulation. And um, if you want to 
just do like web development, you gotta learn JavaScript and Python, JavaScript for the front end and Python for the back end. And that's pretty much it. It just like goes from there. There's so many languages available and yeah. So now what do you say we take a break from your academic life and talk a little about uh, your social life or, or should I say work life? Because uh, I know you have a part-time job too. So yeah. what, does it, what, does it, what is it like working abroad and studying? Yeah. Yeah, working, I shouldn't necessarily, I'm not working just to, because like many people, many Uzbek students who go to the U.S., they work to afford their uh, tuition and just like have enough money mm -hmm. for day-to-day -day living expenses. But for me, I already had Elliot Omini Foundation who was covering all those expenses. I just did it primarily because I want to like have a social life rich of like experience. I, I, there were like lots of like extracurricular activities. There were lots of clubs. The one that I, that, I, that I joined was chess club and we used to have really interesting. Yeah, that's a no brainer <laughs> <laughs> given the fact that you're so much into chess, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm so much into chess in a way, and it was pretty... And what, 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 what are they like? How, how good would you say they are at chess? So there are somewhere, so there's a, this thing, ranking, ELO mm -hmm. ranking, uh -huh. and I'm somewhere, I'm not, because I gave up on it for a couple of months. I'm right now like 1,400. Okay. So all those like top chess players like Magnus Carlsen and Hikaru are like, when it comes to their classical, I think it's 28, 25 something. Mm-hmm. And those guys who were in the chess club, the highest they had was like 2,400. And he was an IM from Russia. All right, we, had a, we had a Russian guy, international master. There are different like, like titles you can get. Grandmaster, mm -hmm. international master, national master, and so on. So we had an actual Russian guy. And he had this like the most stereotypical Russian accent and the look. And it was so funny. Like, spending time with him. So did he sound something like, I'm so happy to have you guys. <laughs> yeah, similar to that, yeah. And he, the Russians are pretty funny, not going to lie. And other than that, we used to have trivia questions. We used to uh -huh. have like pizza nights. We used to talk about different things. We not only focus on the theory and just doing chess, but we also delve deeper into just the social aspect of it, the current world trends. Uh, the, um, the famous Queen's Gambit, the uh, other things, books, movies related to chess, Queen's Sacrifice, which is which stars Tobey Maguire, mm -hmm. and yeah. Other than like those extracurricular activities, I also did a part-time job. I at first. Um, it's I worked for different branches in the university. I worked for parking transportation services, and then I moved on to Student Union, where I worked at a restaurant. It's a Cactus Grill. It's a buffet where students can go and it must eat as much as they can. So it's, it's like all you can eat buffet. All you can eat buffet. They only yeah. pay, I think, thirty bucks, uh -huh. and they can eat. They can stay as long. I think, as long as they want. So and you could just you could just come go in, in the morning. <laughs> come in and I, I'm stay not sure early. if it's legal. I'm not sure. I think they said only an hour but then I can notice you can go in in the morning do your studying and just like stay there the till ent entire dinner, day practically entire the entire day, 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 day and day have day. all your three meals for free yeah yeah so I did work there 20 hours max and as an international student you're only allowed to work 20 hours and it's gonna it's gonna have to be on campus so that's 20 hours a week 20 hours a week right yeah uh -huh. you, you gotta really pay attention mm -hmm. as someone as for those who are watching if you break those immigration rules it's gonna be uh you might get deported no, no. you might actually get deported yeah. yeah so you gotta it's like u.s embassy is pretty strict when it comes to those things yeah but i think those working 20 hours in the university and in the other spheres just gave me a chance to meet lots of people. Actually, I, w I found it surprising that I had so many friends from work than I had from my th 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 than I had made friends with my classmates, because it just gives you a chance to get to know their background. Because you have plenty of like free time at work than having having to spend time with your classmates, 
and I got to know people. There are lots of people from Kazakhstan. There are lots of Mexican people, and yeah, it's like hub for all international students over there. Oh yeah. So now, I got I got a few more questions about a few things you do to stay productive. So I'm I'm guessing as a student who is trying to stay at the top of their class, you there are a few productivity techniques and hacks you follow, and I'd really appreciate it if you could share them with our audience today. So what are a few tips techniques? Productivity hacks that you follow to stay at the top of your game. So there are so many productivity tips that I learned over the years. I used to be a pretty big fan of that motivation industry, self help, self help improvement industry. I used to watch hours of that thing, and uh, <clears throat> so some of the habits that I adopted from watching those videos are um, being able to have like fixed schedule because we we have this internal body clock we should like focus to that we should go to bed and uh, at the same time and wake up at the same time not only that but we should also um have enough flexibility when it comes to uh exercising we should go to a gym regularly we should exercise so and because that that thing itself it's not not only to to build muscle to look good but also it's for your mental health um that that itself will release dopamine and other neurochemicals in your brain that's necessary for growth and yeah i mean when it comes i i just try to approach the problem and try to find the most effective solution to it and i think getting um getting people's opinion on it is also a really good way to go about it so just like have a network of people who are like-minded and who have the same interests as you and they will be able to support you in your tough times. Oh yeah, that's for sure. And one other productivity tip that I would recommend is I wouldn't necessarily call it a productivity tip, but when I'm actually doing something like this podcast or taking a task or doing something really important that actually requires my brain to work, I I I don't eat like Five six hours prior, so it's like fasting. It's like fasting. I think form of I, like, intermittent you, fasting. You know, there's like uh, social media influencer Andrew Tate, right? <laughs> I don't wanna I don't wanna say anything about him. Yeah. But I'm just like uh, yeah, like pointing at a segment of his uh-huh. speech where he talks about like fasting. Mm-hmm. We as humans, for example, from ancient times, even though it's been like millennia, like millions of years from our earlier predecessors. We still our some of our some parts of our brain haven't evolved that much. We still have that uh, the instincts and the hormonal reactions and stuff like this. So back in the time, when their brains really worked is when they were hungry, when they were hunting, when they were like searching for food, is when they like tried to think of different strategies and became really efficient. But I'm not really saying it to for extended period of time. I'm saying it for like five, six hours before you do really something important. But in our religion also, there's this like month where you fast for uh, 14, 15 hours. And I think also has scientific reasoning behind it. And not only it will make you sharp, but also it will, but also it will, um, if I'm not mistaken, eat your cancer cells and it's kind of, it's kind of a rejuvenating experience. It's, like it kind of helps with the aging uh, aging problem. It kind of de-escalates it. Yeah, I can actually speak from personal experience. Like intermittent fasting is something I've been doing myself for a few years now. But I actually want to highlight some of its uh, downsides. Like when you starve yourself, it it's it might give it might give you might end up getting stomach ulcer. Right there's that, yeah. and on top of that, sometimes your brain run, runs out of oxygen and nutrients, right? Which is something happened to me a while ago, and I had to go and see a doctor, and he basically told me to take it easy on my diet, and it probably quit fasting for some time, which is what I did, <laughs> and I was, and I actually figured that 
the right way to go about your diet is to have a balanced diet where you're not too overboard with one type of diet like carnivore or keto or all, all these different types of diets. What you might want to do is actually <laughs> try all these different diets and see which one works for you best or maybe come up with your own. So let me ask you this question. Sorry for interrupting you. So do you know the uh, social uh, He's also an influencer, Jordan Peterson, and how he follows the carnivore diet. Yeah. He only eats meat. And but, I think but, but, yeah, but here's the, here's the, the thing. Uh, just because it worked for him doesn't necessarily mean it works for you. Uh, you have to take into account the fact that we all have different biology uh, now and that we have different, you know, needs, dietary needs, right? Some people are lactose intolerant and some people are simply their stomach doesn't do well when they eat too much meat, right? Yeah. And we actually need a balanced diet where you have a little bit of veggies, a little bit of meat, a little bit of, you know, your carbs to help you sleep well, right? Uh, I've honestly been... I've actually quite, I've been doing research on my own, reading, listening to podcasts for the past few years on diet, health, and productivity. And what I've come to learn is, what I've come to learn is, uh, so there is no really one size fits all answer, right? When it comes to diet and health, right? And, and I think the right way to go about it is if, like I said, try all these different uh, diets I and think, find the one yeah. that fits you the best. And I guess the same applies to your workout regime or your sleeping routine. So it, yeah, it, I was going to mention that part that it not only applies to your diet or workout regime, it applies to everything. Okay. Try out different tactics. Yeah. If you watch YouTube videos and what one tactic works for that person may not work for you when it comes yeah. to taking ILTS, taking SAT. Yeah. Because people are different learners. Some people are visual learners. Some people learn through different means. Yeah. So you got to experiment yeah. with different things to see which one works for you. Yeah, yeah. Just because someone, celebrity, popular, influential doing it and they're successful doesn't necessarily mean you should go ahead and do it too, right? Yeah, uh, you might exactly. get your you might get your fingers burnt if you're not careful. <laughs> sure. So I think I think what other thing that I want to mention is that they might also say it for like I don't know they they want to sound interesting or they wanted to yeah like, probably their extreme diet their yeah. extreme lifestyle is it like pretty hard to keep? For example, that like Andrew Tate model that I like brought it up earlier. He says he drinks like 15 cups of coffee each oh. day and sm smokes cigars. <laughs> Kids this out there, don't, don't try it at home, don't, okay? Don't 15, home, 15 no. cups of coffee a day is going to get you killed, right? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I mean, in a way that, that like behind the scenes lifestyle mm -hmm. of like those like influencers on Instagram and other social media platforms, I think that our youngsters shouldn't take them as role models. They should just like learn certain parts yeah. and they should have the like basic filtering thing where they can see, oh, this is misinformation. This is not something that I want to, I would want to try. This is not practical. And I think you, you, you will learn that gradually through life experiences. Oh yeah. 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 I almost did myself serious damage, like going on this intermittent fasting and lifting too heavy. Yeah, and not only now I'm learning my lessons and kind of trying to balance my uh, workout routine as well as my diet. Yeah. So yeah, the and right way to go about it yeah. is, is to have a balance. Try striking a balance in life, you know. Yeah. Besides those extracurricular activities, I forgot to mention I also um, did workout four times a week. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it was pretty good that the university offered it for free. It's part of the tuition mm -hmm. and it's actually pretty crazy that when you go to the gym there are all these other people who are working out and it just keeps you motivated and there's just like room for growth all the time and i i not only see it work out as like building muscle getting endurance just like as a means for working out but also i see it as a way for me to relieve stress and just do something that that's physical because I've been doing thing that involves my brain capacity. I just want to like, yeah, you know. something that gets you mentally working. Yeah. Now, what do you say we talk a little about your future goals? Like, what do you see yourself doing in say a couple of years from now? 
I mean, I, I know it's, it might be a little bit of a personal question, but uh, I'm sure there are people out there curious to know uh, what students normally do once they get a degree in computer science or once they go abroad. So would you like to, yeah. you know, w work your way towards U.S. citizenship or would you like to lend a job? Uh, there are so many aspects to this there. question, and I don't find it as I don't find it that much personal. But I, I just want to give a general rule of thumb in in here is that I I wanted to give some information about the sponsorship program that I'm going with, which is a Youth Media Foundation, and it's a uh, you make a contract with them as they finance everything, uh, tuition, visa, flight, um, day to day expenses, rent, eating, and everything. And once you graduate, you have to come back to Uzbekistan and work for at least five years. If it's like a remote place, it's, it's only three years. It's for a bachelor's degree. So my, my plans are kind of tied to that contract is that I, I have two more years left at my university. Once I graduate, I have to come back and um, kind of continue on my journey, journey, for, journey for working um, for Uzbek government. I don't know what position it's gonna be exactly. I have my options open, mm -hmm. but I hope it's gonna be in a sector that's gonna be helpful for mm -hmm. Uzbek people. Uh, I don't see myself as teaching uh, <laughs> in, in, in the teaching sector because uh, I know that like in, in in our family, my parents like uncle you are you are teaching like everyone is in the teaching industry and I see you guys stressed out all the time. Uh, I, I, uh, how often do you see me stressed out? I'm happy as a clam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah I, I feel like i'm doing one of the best jobs in the world like i know yeah, there, it's kind of there it's, are ups and downs to it but uh, but you know generally speaking teaching is not that bad after all yeah it's very fulfilling experience mm -hmm. and your students after they take ielts they'll be grateful mm -hmm. for your hard work for the rest of their lives it's a job that's that's very beneficial to to the society i would say but i'm saying that from my character, from my interests, I wouldn't, I couldn't see myself as teaching because mm -hmm. teaching I know involves uh, the type of patience that I might not have because, uh -huh. because I, I want to be surrounded in an environment where I, I want to be constantly innovating in a way mm -hmm. where for teachers also you have like lots of room for innovation and therefore I, I see myself working for a private, se uh, for a sector that's involved with manufacturing, that's involved with customer service, design. And <clears throat> in that regard, I think this is gonna be uh, beautiful. But um, my other plans would involve, once I do complete all those five years, I might possibly do a master's degree, go abroad again. It just depends on all those five years that I, I spend here. Um, that's why I hope that your business also like succeeds, this education center. Maybe I might have something to. I have also. I have to. I might have some things to take part into this industry. Be involved with it in some regard. Uh, yeah. Yeah, would love to see you in our team one day. Maybe help us out, uh, build our web page, or you know, run our operations online. Yeah. Not only you guys should have ILTS and SAT, but mm -hmm. I, I think like you guys are going in the direction of scaling up, like opening branches and stuff. And I think. In that regard, uh, you can like scale up to other things where you guys only had IELTS, then you added SAT. Now you guys can add, for example, uh, a section section where you guys teach IT to other students. You can add a ACT standardized test, SAT subject test, and it goes on and on until you might like actually become like a school, a yeah, private school. That yeah. 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 The future is exciting yeah so uh, i guess i'm almost done here with my questions so do you have any questions you would like to ask me yeah uh, i think that you did a pretty good job of like setting everything up in terms of uh, this podcast and and, um, and for the record, I wasn't the one who set up the podcast. There are all these guys behind yeah. the scenes working. You were They're the one who kind of gave them the direction uh, they, they were going through. For, my question for me would be um, the same question that you, uh, you asked me. What do you see yourself doing in like five, ten years with this education center? But just your like, if it's not personal, uh, no. can you also share some plans you have for 
the students and this education center. I mean, ten year timeline is is a as distant future. Like I haven't really thought that far, right? I'm 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 literally thinking about what I'm gonna do next after this podcast. <laughs> Once we get off this podcast, uh, but long term, I guess I'll I'll, I'll I'll I still see myself teaching, but probably on much bigger scale, right? When I started out, I was teaching probably a couple of students, and then I went on to teach uh, a medium sized class, and then you know. As I as time went over, went over, I I started teaching bigger groups. So I see myself teaching probably an audience of fifty, hundred people eventually, right? And 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 the way I see it is, uh, teaching is a big part of my life, and this is something I've been doing for quite some time. I, but at the same time, I'm open to adventures. So like this, the, this podcast we're having here is a new challenge that I took on, and I, I honestly have no idea how this is gonna go. But I'm trying to keep an open mind and have that optimistic yeah. view and keep that positive mindset, like you talked about earlier. And yeah, I think going into teaching or or being an entrepreneur and doing all these working on all these different po- projects is like is like venturing into the unknown, like yeah. it's uncharted territory, it's uncharted map for me. So I think I'm just gonna figure it out as I go. Even yeah. though it depends on certain certain uh, circumstances, you still see, your, see yourself teaching in five to 10 years. Cause like, I think a couple of years ago to three years ago, you were kind of curious on the um, mm-hmm. development of the ID sector because at the time I was also doing research and I was giving those like sites to you like uh, the one I, I can also mention it in front of the camera so i think that students will probably benefit from it mm-hmm. so if you don't have the capacity to learn uh, to go to the abroad to go abroad and um study in the us in other universities is you can there's a website called edX where you can find courses that are taught by top prestigious universities like harvard yale and it's you can audit the course for free but if you want to get the certificate, you have to pay the fee. Mm-hmm. But I think getting acquainted with those courses will be also very beneficial for you when you when you're first getting started. So at the time, like two three years ago, you were kind of curious, and I gave you this suggestion. And but I'm I'm still like pretty happy that you want to stick with teaching, and since it's been really a big part of your life, and you want to make it online. Do you do you see some challenges with this teaching becoming online? Uh, I honestly lack experience in this arena because I've literally never done, never taught anyone online, right? But I'm, I'm confident that our friends who are experienced in this field would, would be happy, would be glad to help us out with uh, this whole new project, teaching online. But uh, I'm for the most part a big, oppon- big opponent of online teaching because online teaching lacks that human aspect, right? Where you don't feel the presence of your teacher. So, you, and, and because of that, you don't feel as much responsible. And yeah, I, I feel like nothing really can beat that human face-to-face interaction. And, 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 and Learning is not just about acquisition of information. It's also about sort of bonding. And a lot of it is lost when you're learning online. And I, But this is not to take anything away from online teaching, which is a godsend to a lot of people who simply don't have access to decent education in their hometown, their locality, but can... Uh, but they can learn from world-class teachers uh, with a click of a button. Yeah, that's a massive yeah. game changer. But when possible, I think uh, my your choice should be face-to-face teaching, where you can interact with the person, where you can, uh, you know, be in the <laughs> moment, uh, learn, and all, at the same time develop communication skills, which is something uh, you don't get to do when you are interacting online. Like, I, I don't think having this podcast online would be as interesting and as, as effective as having it face-to-face, right? 
Yeah. And and this for this entire reason, I decided to seize the moment and have my first podcast with you, right? Before you return to the U.S. for your studies. Yeah, I do agree with that point completely. Learning is not mm -hmm. just um, you shouldn't just do online teaching just for the sake of learning. It should also be like the acquisition of knowledge because we as human species have the tendency to learn something like where like our memories are like formed by association to something like the way that for example i, I read this book I'm, I'm not sure if you've read that book it's like uh there were some things that were popular is like you can learn like fifty thousand words in like two three months and stuff like that and the way their their approach was associating each word with something that they can visualize and it just boosts their memory um, mm -hmm. like by a factor of 10 at least mm -hmm. and uh, you see all those people who are trying to memorize a list of words and stuff like that and it, it really helped them with that in general but I think um, I, the, the, the reason I was bringing up online education is that you see all those like Khan Academy and other websites where they have interactive quizzes um, exercises and other things where you can just test out your knowledge maybe you guys if you have like time and opportunity you can make a like a course like that and see how many people are interested because it's going to be also great for your business as you have lots of people um, taking that course and leaving a feedback on the way on your methodology on your uh, approach to teaching a class so oh yeah yeah that's for sure yeah there are all different perspectives to go around, right? Uh, this is something we'll totally consider down the line. All right, I guess uh, I'm done with all my questions here. I feel like uh, it was not bad for our first attempt, right? Yeah. So uh, I am uh, really glad to have you on the show, and I, I, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show today and uh, sharing with us all these insights and your experience. So where can people find you on the internet? Can yeah, you so for all those things, I hope that the video editor uh, will leave the links down below. And um, I'm going to also leave my uh, personal Instagram channel down and you mm -hmm. guys can ask me any question relating to um, applying to U.S. colleges and other things. And I hope uh, thanks for having me to this podcast and I hope next year I come here we're going to have this like interesting conversation again uh, sorry if I made any mistakes or if I went off topic sometimes it, it's also my first time doing it's, it's my first time doing this podcast doing, doing something in front of the camera but uh, thanks for giving me this uh, chance and I hope that people who are watching this podcast learn something in value yeah yeah that's for sure alright guys thanks for watching today's show and I hope it was useful and don't forget to subscribe and leave us some comments. All right. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.